job and certainly is important to the medical culture. I think across the movement there's pretty broad agreement that we should get money out of politics. The debates happen as to what's the best way to do that. Uh, and so this is particularly good to get David here to give us the move to amend approach. In 2011, at our annual assembly of ethical societies, we did pass a resolution condemning Citizens United for allowing, quote, money special interest groups to manipulate public policy with the devastating effects on the citizens of the United States and our American democracy as we know it. And the resolution encouraged people to uh, ask their state legislatures and all government officials and uh, for, to get uh, prior approval, to get unions and for-profit corporations having to get prior approval before, uh, from their members and stockholders before contributing to campaigns and to disclose such contributions. Uh, this was a good resolution, but certainly David and uh, Move to Amend is uh, a broader strategy with a broader, broader goals. Um, many of our members have worked in other groups like Common Cause and Public Citizen and Wolf Pack with the Article 5 Convention of States idea and Root Strikers that uh, follows her, uh, Lawrence Lessing's approach. So uh, we're going to put this into the mix. Will. And Wolf, <laughs> Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Uh, now, now let me move on to our speaker for tonight, David Cobb. David is an outreach director for Move to Amend and a founding member of the Board of Directors and author of We the People Amendment. He's a lawyer, a political activist. David sued corporate polluters, has lobbied elected officials, run for political office himself, and has been arrested for nonviolent disobedience. He believes that we must use all the tools in our toolbox to affect social systemic change that we desperately need. He was born in San Leon, Texas, worked as a laborer, and then went to college. Graduated from the University of Houston Law School in 1993, and after a successful private law practice in Houston, they devoted himself to full-time activism to achieve real democracy in the United States. In 2002, David ran for the Attorney General of Texas, pledging to use the office to revoke the charters of corporations that repeatedly violated health, safety, and environmental laws. Though he didn't win, the Green Party of Texas grew from having four local chapters to having 26, greatly due to his campaign. And in 2004, he ran for the President of the United States with the Green Party ticket and successfully campaigned for the Ohio recount. David, the mic is yours. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. And because I know that you're human beings who understand the world through stories, y'all, I'm fixing to tell a story. Okay. I'm going to tell a story on how it came to be that these large transnational corporations are not merely exercising power today. I'm going to tell the story on how corporations are ruling us. Because as surely as masters once ruled slaves, as surely as kings once ruled subjects, unelected and unaccountable corporate CEOs are ruling us because they're making the decisions. Corporate CEOs have already decided how much poison will be in the air that we're all breathing right now. Corporate CEOs decided how much toxic poison can be in the public water supply of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Corporate CEOs decide whether you get health care or not, notwithstanding what your doctor or physician says. Corporate CEOs decided to take this country into war. And we the people, we get to choose between Coke or Pepsi. We can choose between paper or plastic at a grocery store checkout line. We can choose between Ford or Chevrolet or, or, or Chrysler, you know, we are inundated with consumer choices, which is fine, but don't mistake a consumer choice with political power. Because political power would be the opportunity to participate in a meaningful way with how our society is organized. And saying it that way, I submit to you, we almost never, as Americans, get an opportunity to really participate in the structure, the systems in which we live. So I... Four topics together. I want to be very explicit. The first topic that we're going to cover is democracy. That word gets tossed around a lot. So to make sure that we've actually got some common ground, I want to ask, anybody know from what language the word democracy derives? Greek. 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 Very good. Demos means? People. The people. Kratia, K-R-A-T-I-A. Anybody know? Uh, it means, very good. Rule or govern. So literally the word democracy means the people rule. Pop quiz, y'all. How many of y'all believe we the people are ruling today? Don't be shy. Look around. Not a single person raised your hand. We've got a great crowd here tonight. 
Not a single one of you were willing to say that we the people rule in the United States. And you know, I give this presentation all across the country. I ask that question everywhere I go. Nobody raises their hands anymore. That's a problem. But saying it another way, I think it's a good thing. What? Oh, no, no. It's not a good thing that we the people are not ruling in the United States. I actually think it's a problem that we are being courageous enough to admit that we don't rule in this country. You see, notwithstanding the creation myth of this country, notwithstanding what I was taught as a child, what I suspect many of you were taught as a children, we the people are not actually ruling in this country. And the evidence is clear. Polling data shows that the majority of Americans want to transition away from the fossil fuel industry to alternative sustainable energy solutions. And yet it doesn't happen. The majority of Americans want access to health care as a fundamental human right, only instead it's still a commodity that's bought and paid for as a profit. The majority of Americans believe that if you work 40 hours a week, you ought to make a living wage that qualifies you and your family to live in dignity. See, I could go through the list of what polling data shows, regardless of the, whether it's the Democrats or Republicans or independents alike, the majority of Americans do not actually agree with the society in which we're living in. We, the people, are not ruling in the United States. In fact, if we were going to stay with the Greek language, we'd have to admit it's not a democracy, it's an oligarchy. Oh. The rule by a wealthy elite. In fact, things are getting so bad, I think we might need to make up a new word. Let's call it a kleptocracy. Uh -huh. <laughs> the rule by the thieving wealthy elite. Because that's what they're doing, and we need to be willing to say it out loud. They are stealing from us. They are stealing our labor, but more importantly, they are stealing our future. They are stealing the commons that belongs to all of us as human beings. It is our birthright to actually be per able to participate in a meaningful way in, the, the, in creation itself that we are part of and yet we are not experiencing it. So I think it's important to recognize democracy is a damn good idea and we ought to have it. Yes. Yes. Yeah, there you go. See, I want to take a moment to really underscore something and think about it. The concept of sovereignty, who has the authority to rule, not just the authority to rule, but the structures and the systems, the principles of how we organize society, that is one of the most important things that any group of human beings ever, ever decide for themselves. And in his introductory remarks, you did mention that I'm a Green Party member, and I'm proud of that. But you know what else? I'm equally proud to say I have a long history of working with Democrats on issues where there's common ground. And I will continue uh, to work on issues with common ground with Democrats. But I'm going to go you one better. I have a history of working with Republicans on issues where there's common ground. And I'm going to tell you, during the fight against the Patriot Act, during the fight uh, against NAFTA, during the fights in the global justice movement, I was frequently working in conjunction with <coughs> Republicans and Libertarians, and I have a history of doing that. Look, I'll work with anybody if I can find some common ground. And I say that not so you'll pat me on the head. I say it so you'll appreciate what I mean when I tell you that in my 30 years of social change work, looking for people to collaborate and partner with, I've never had the privilege or the opportunity to work in coalition with a monarchist. <laughs> I can't find any. They don't exist anymore. But 500 years ago, that's all there were. Think about that. In 500 years, that's the blink of an eye in human history. So honestly, folks, when people tell me, oh, you can't amend the Constitution, that's too hard. We'll never do that. I think, have you not been paying attention? <laughs> because throughout all of history, profound changes have been made. And I don't mean just changes in one president or another. I don't mean one party or another. I mean the systems and the structures for how our society is organized have profoundly changed. Abolition of slavery. Women being acknowledged to be people with constitutional rights. The civil rights movement, the trade union movement. See, these kind of changes can happen and here it comes. Because the Texans going to get a little metaphysical on y'all, so be ready. We are all individually participating in creating our shared collective. Narratives and cultural understandings, that is in fact something that we are collectively creating. 
right? And so that's where we actually actually have to have real responsibility for that concept. The third idea that I want to make sure that we're clear on is the very concept of legal personhood. Please note that I did not write corporate personhood on the board, right? Because I just want to cover the concept of legal personhood, which means the ability to assert rights. And by that, I mean the ability to assert rights under law. And saying it that way, I hope it's obvious that this matters. This is not a technicality that only lawyers should concern themselves with. The ability to assert laws under, and, and have those laws actually protect your rights, that's at the core of every social movement this country has ever seen. From the American Revolution itself, onto the abolitionist movement, and the women's suffrage movement, and the trade union movement, and the civil rights movement. See, legal personhood matters, and it matters a lot. Our generation has been taught not to think about it. Our generation has been taught that only lawyers and judges and the courts should concern themselves with it. But you know, Americans of other generations actually recognize the truth, which is it's our constitution. It's our government. It's our society. We're supposed to actually participate. And yes, by voting, but not merely by voting. We're actually supposed to be allowed and encouraged to participate in far deeper ways. And the last word on the board, at least for now, is corporation. Anybody know what language that's from? Very good. Corpus means body. body. And the suffix T-I-O-N means to have or create. So literally, the word corporation translated means to have or create body. And by body, I mean literal physical body. That's because in law school we are taught, and by the way, are there any other lawyers in the crowd besides me that would admit it? <laughs> we got one back here. So I'll ask my sister at the bar. Do you remember being taught in law school that a corporation is a legal fiction? Is that ringing a bell? A corporation is a legal fiction? Yes? Yes? I, I've yet to meet a lawyer who doesn't at least remember like that vaguely, even if you didn't practice that. In fact, it's so common, watch this. If you've heard that phrase, even if you couldn't precisely define it, even though the rest of you didn't go to law school, but if you've heard that a corporation is a legal fiction, raise your hand. Be honest. Look at all these hands go up, right? So, friends, if a corporation is a legal fiction, that begs this question. What does the word fiction mean? Not true. Not true! <laughs> made up! Here's the concept, y'all. In law school, day one of corporations class, the professor stood before us in our class and she said to us, you have to understand that a corporation doesn't actually exist in the material, physical world. And I thought, isn't that called reality? But she went on to say, but we're going to pretend like this group of investors and these shareholders and the contractual obligations that they make and the assets, we're going to pretend like it's one thing so that we can treat it a certain way under law. And remember, if enough people think that something is true and enough people act like it's true, it's, it's true. true. It's true. Friends, a corporation is a construct. It doesn't actually physically exist.